sound check for you guys. Uh, anybody can hear me? Just type in the chat if you can hear me. Cool. Um, so I'm going to be checking in on the chat occasionally. Um, sounds like people can hear me okay. But I'm going to be mostly focused on the coding. And so uh, I will look for questions occasionally if you guys are confused about something. Uh, but I'm not going to be paying a ton of attention to it. I'm just going to get started in the background, waiting for people to join, uh, doing a little bit of block diagramming here. It's always good to start with a nice block diagram, kind of documenting what it is you're going to be doing. So do a quick block diagram here, just kind of showing the goal of this project. Um, but basically, I'm going to take the Go board, call this the Go board. Uh, which is an FPGA development board for you guys who haven't played with it or checked out my channel. Um, it is available if anybody wants to get one. Uh, it looks like this purple thing right here. And that's what I'm going to be programming today um, to do the test to do this project. Uh, this is going to be connected to a keypad. So this is a digital int keypad. Buy them. And it uses what's called a PMOD interface to talk to the Go board. So I'll draw that here. Let's see, where's the arrows? Is there an arrow button? I haven't used Visio in a while. And this is going to be taking in some data, basically the keypad data. So any keys that get pushed. Go here. This is a PMOD interface. It's a standard interface that uh, Digilint uses. Wow, that's upside down. Neat. Um, the nice thing about PMOD is um, it's pretty standard. So if you use it in one location and get familiar with it, it uh, there's a lot of different use cases for it. And then this is going to be driving either a seven. I haven't exactly decided here what the Go board is going to be driving. It's either going to be a seven segment display or just some LEDs. I'll start with seven segment though. Boy, I wish I remembered how to do an arrow in. Oh yeah, that's what this line ends. There we go. This does not need to be this big. All right, so this is, at a super high level, this is what we're gonna be doing. So uh, here is the Go board uh, right here. Here is the keypad from Digilint here. This connection here is the PMOD interface between the two. And that's going to be, the first thing I'm going to do is try to drive this seven segment display. So what I'm going to try to do first is when I push the number one, two, three, etc., I'm going to get that number to light up on the seven segment display. 
That's the first part of this project. Once that happens successfully, then I know that I'm getting the button presses from the keypad to the FPGA and they're understood correctly. Um, then I'm going to be adding in some state machine code to basically create a, a safe of sorts. So I'll create a, a special password that's built into the FPGA. And if I type that password correctly, um, then I'm going to light up an LED or something to that effect that shows that the, the password was entered correctly. If the password's entered incorrectly in the wrong order, or in the, if it's the wrong password, then I'll light up a different LED, something like that. Um, really, the purpose of this video is just to demonstrate how state machines work and how to create one in, uh, in your FPGA. I'm going to be using Verilog for this design um, just because I have a 50-50 choice between Verilog and VHDL and today is a Verilog day. So uh, sorry to people who wanted VHDL, perhaps in the future we will do a VHDL one. I'm not going to obsess over this too much. Alright, let me check, make sure people are still... I've got 40 people in here. Seems like people are still viewing. This is going to be a long video, um, so feel free to just like put it in the background. Um, I am starting from scratch on a on a you know via Verilog design here. So um, for people who just want to like keep it in the background and see what it's like to program an FPGA every now and then, you can just pop open the video, take a quick look. Um, but this will take me just to give you guys a, an idea. You know, at least an hour um, to do this whole thing. So. Um, yeah, maybe more. I'm not exactly sure how long it's going to take. This is a bit new for me as well. So let's get started here. Um, so let me introduce this uh, PMOD, this PMOD design a little bit here. So this is the, the PMOD keypad here. It actually, um, so it's $9, I think, plus shipping. So it's not too expensive. Um, and it comes with some reference code. So in, over here in the resource center, I was able to pull in some uh, Verilog code. Not the prettiest Verilog code, I'll say, but uh, at least it gives you a head start here. So right here in the Nexus 3 Verilog example, uh, there is some Verilog code. You know, a lot of these boards generally have some code you can get started with. And so I'm not going to try to write my own stuff for this particular interface. Um, I'd rather just, you know, get the data in correctly and uh, not have to worry too much about writing it myself. So um, it comes with three different things. So it comes with the, uh, let's see, first thing, so... At the lowest level, I guess, is the decoder. So the way this thing kind of works at a low level is not super important. Um, you kind of you need to look at the schematic to fully understand it. But basically, what it's doing is it's it's driving uh, it's it's like driving two signals on like the row and the column, and then if the the row and the column is pressed down uh, at that row and column intersection, it'll like detect that that button is pressed. So it's like driving the row and column, and then it's getting some feedback. Um, it's driving row and it's getting feedback on column and it's able to decode uh, what key gets pressed based on kind of the, the row and column driving that it's doing. So it's a, it's a bit of a clever interface. Um, you know, it, well, another way to do it would be like each button gets its own GPIO or something like that, but there probably isn't enough GPIO. Yeah, there's not enough GPIO on the, there's only 10 pins on the PMOD connection. So how do you get 16 signals and 16 key presses to a 10 pin interface? They used a clever trick to do row and column decoding. Um, so it's a, but it's a little bit more confusing. Um, so I won't go into too much detail about how that works. It's not super important. It's not really what I'm trying to get at. Um, what I'm trying to get at is just how does a state machine work? And we're building up to that. So let's, let's work towards that. So first thing I'm going to be instantiating, I'm going to create a new file. That's, uh, let's call it keypad state machine demo dot dot b for dot verilog and this is going to be the top of the file so top of the design this is going to be like the main fpga so when I, usually when i do an fpga design i'll call something top and that means like the fpga itself and then that'll instantiate modules underneath it that's just my personal preference and i'll copy some of this uh we have other I'll just copy some of this basic, basic stuff here. So module, here's the name of the module, keypad, state, machine, demo, 
Alright, that's for underscores for this. Like that. I'm actually gonna keep rename this to keep it uh, consistent. I've been using um, VS Code more and more, and I used uh, I still use Emacs, so don't give me too much of a hard time here. Um, but VS Code has some real nice things, like it's got Git built into it, um, so I can just commit this code directly to, to GitHub for you all to see when we're done. Um, there's some really nice features, so in general, I've um, been using this more and more. This is going to be the pmod. I'm going to have to do some pmod signals here. Let me get back to that. And put it. Um, we're going to be driving some seven segment displays. You know what? It's going to be easier if I just copy this from another project. So let's take a look at. Here we go. I'm just going to copy this interface. Just rather than typing all that out, I don't want to do that. Nobody's got time for that. This is better. There's no UART on this project. There's no Bluetooth on this project. There is a seven segment display. I'm just going to use one seven segment display and I might use some LED outputs as well. So. This is faster. Um, we definitely have a clock. All right, that's the top of the design right there. So what is this top of the design gonna be instantiating? So first of all, it's gonna be instantiating the decoder itself. So this is the, the module that the Digilent folks wrote. Thank you, Michelle Yu and Josh Sakos from Digilent for writing this that I am leveraging heavily. So I'm gonna be instantiating a decoder. And I'm also going to be instantiating the seven segment display. So let's do the decoder real quick. So this is uh, in an order to instantiate a module in Verilog, it's dot and then the signal so the dot is the signal in the in the module itself and then in the parentheses is the signal at the at the module you're coding at so dot clock is the signal inside the decoder and at this level i call it i clock which is the signal coming in from the fpga so dot clock inside the decoder gets tied to i clock dot row inside here is going to be have to i'm going to have to create an intermediary, intermediary signal to do row so that'll be, that's not defined yet. Um, dot call gets w call. w underscore is usually what I use for wires. And decode out gets decode out. Do that. And that should be the module there. So I don't yet know what w row and w call are. We're going to define those shortly. Oh, I need to name this decoder. I usually just call it inst for the instance of the decoder itself. So this is the module name. This will look for a module called decoder um, and then the, the name of the decoder itself. Um, if there are any parameters in the decoder, you can put parameters here with a pound, uh, pound open parentheses, and then the name of the uh, of any parameters. So if you have like, uh, or generic, it would be like the same thing as a generic in, um, in VHDL. But this module doesn't have any, so I don't need to worry about that. All right, so what are um, let's see here. Go back to this one. Did I def I'm gonna pull in some more signals. Um, I'm only driving one seven segment display and not two, as I said before. Sometimes I need two seven segment displays for other projects. This one just needs one. I can remove. Let's see if I remember how to do this. There's a way to do rectangular copy paste here. I forget. Feels the old fashioned way. All right, 
right, so these are my seven segment displays. Um, the reason I need these wires here, you know, the, the seven segment display itself, um, let me think about this. Yes. The seven segment display itself uh, is the, the logic is inverted on the outputs here. So I need to just have an intermediary signal invert it, which is this not this tilde here is the inversion, the, the Boolean, uh, Boolean bitwise inversion. And then it's assigning the output here. So that's the purpose there. A lot of, a lot of typing just to invert a signal, but you know, that's Verilog and DHDL for you. Okay, this is the decoder itself. Decoder uh, communicates with the keypad to pull in decoded digit. So that should be good. The only thing now I need to do is, let's see. So first of all, uh, decode out I believe it was a 4-bit, it should be 4 bits, I believe. Let me just double check, because uh, iBinaryNum expects a 4-bit binary number to drive to the 7-segment display. So let me go ahead and double check. Decode out is in fact 4 bits, that's good. Uh, that's what I expect. So 3 down to 0 for decode out. Uh, I need to define that. Wire 3 down to 0, decode out. So that's defined there. And then I need to define my uh, row and column, which again is three down to zero. And this, I'm not 100% sure what to do here. So this might take me a minute to figure this out. And in the meantime, I'm gonna check in on the stream. What's up, friends? All right, let me see what we got here. Hey, Eton, I did a video about metastability. If you look up my uh, old videos, there's a video about metastability. Hello from Russia. Uh, for this video, I'm using uh, the Namland Go board here. So that's a development board tied to a Digilent keypad board here. You can buy these at nanland.com. Um, it's a really good beginner board for uh, if you want to learn programming. There's a lot of different features on it. So there's a VGA display, seven segment displays, buttons, LEDs, a PMOD connection here, a UART connection here. Basically a lot of different things you can use to give yourself a lot of different projects to work with. So a lot of my frustration with other FPGA boards is they just give you an FPGA and some connections and it's like, well, what am I supposed to do with this? Uh, the Go board really has a lot of different uh, features built into it so you can get started and also have like fun things to work with, to work on right away without having to buy a bunch of connections or get a breadboard or anything like that. Cool. All right, so now I do need to figure out what row and column get mapped to here. So that's going to be me thinking for a minute. So row and column are rows and columns on the keypad. Let's see if I can use, they had a, a demo here. A-N, anodes, cathodes. It's very cryptic wiring here, guys. Port on JA. JA 3 to 0 is columns. JA 10 to 7 is rows. I think this is a PMOD connection here. Because it's an in out. I'm trying to like decode what they were doing in like in their heads. Sometimes when you have signals called like JA and AN, this frustrates me to no end. Like just call it seven segment anode or something like why do you have to be <laughs> is it really that hard to type uh, this is like a, a frustration i have about fpga designs in general in c and other languages is like you know the name of the function is four words long and it describes what it does very nicely in in fpga code it's like a n what the hell is that seg really uh, you know you feel free to type it's not the worst thing in the world 
All right, so I think this is a PMOD connection. I think I understand what this is looking for here. All right, so I think what this is doing go over to here. Every now and then you need to look at the schematic to see exactly if this makes sense. Yeah, so... Here is the schematic, by the way, for the uh, keypad. So as I was saying, is like a row column decoding thing going on here. And here's the, God, why can't I go to the right? Over here is the actual PMOD connection. So row four, you know, one, two, three, four, get mapped to 10, nine, eight, seven. That's for row. So row, JA seven to four, seven to four. Okay, well, I know here that row one should be mapped to PMOD 10. So let's do that. So I know I have a bunch of PMOD signals. I'm gonna have, I haven't created those yet. So let's do that first. So the, which one's output, row or column? So output is column. By the way, I like to call signals like O underscore call, for example, or I underscore row, so that I don't have to do what I just did there, which is like go into the module to figure out if it's an input or an output. Really simple thing. Um, so on all my modules, you will see I have I underscore signal name, O underscore signal name. Very simple, very helpful. Um, please do that. This is an output. Rather than me doing this, which is the alternative, is you just have a comment that says whether or not it's an input or an output. Um, too often see this and I don't like it. Okay, so column is an output. So that's one, two, three, four are all outputs. So let's do that here. So output IOP mod one is call four. App call four. Output mod two. App to call three. Like that. Uh, B signals, IOP mod one, two, three, four, come from, oops, come from the actual um, physical constraints file. So the actual constraints for the uh, NAMLAID go board is where those come from which I can pull up just to show you guys what that looks like. That'll, that'll be more important when we're actually programming the device. Uh, so I'll wait on that actually for when we get to the part where we're programming. Okay, so then inputs, what do we got for inputs? We got IO, PMOD. So these are the outputs, rows are inputs. So seven is four. And six, five, oh no, eight, that goes eight, nine, ten, doesn't it? Eight, nine, ten. Three, two, one. Okay. So now um, let's let's basically so now I need to use concatenation to build uh, you can do a couple different things. Um, I need to basically uh, put these signals together, 7, 8, 9, 10, and 1, 2, 3, 4, to map them into these wires here, W row and W column, in order to get them in to the so that the decoder can properly understand it. So let's do um, W underscore row first. So we got W row of z in bit position 0. Uh, sorry, I'm going to make these 0 based instead of so that it's clear. So W row zero, oops, sign. A sing? No. 
uh, assign w row zero equal to what did I say? IO pmod ten. Uh, this is one way to do it. You could do each one individually. You can also do uh, w underscore row. Uh, this will do the whole thing effectively three down to zero like this. Um, and I can do concatenation in Verilog, which is the um, open bracket, close bracket thing. And this is probably a little bit more straightforward, so I'll do it this way. Uh, so IO pmod seven, IO pmod eight, IO pmod nine, IO pmod ten. Uh, this is concatenation. Super useful, and uh, you can also use replication, which is fun too. Um, I like Verilog, it's got a couple tricks like this, uh, especially the replication operator. That's fun. Uh, you can get rid of this three down to zero because it's implied. Uh, basically, it'll. You don't need this. Uh, Verilog's very forgiving. So I take something called w underscore row, I concatenate bit three, bit two, bit one, bit zero together, and that'll build it up into a four bit wire. Same thing for call. Um, sorry, no, other way around. So column is an output. So column is a four bit output. Now I need to take those four bits and assign uh, the, the, the output of each of the P mods. Uh, these four outputs here, I need to assign them each one to one of the column bits. So the simplest thing to do here, uh, this one you can't really do in one line. You have to do each, each output assignment individually. So assign IO P mod one to call three, I said, so W call bit three. This is bit three. Um, and then IOP mod two equals W call two. P mod three, W call one. There you go. So this is signing each PMOD output to a single bit of W call. This is assigning or building up uh, a four bit wire using concatenation. Okay, so that, let's see, that should be most of what we're looking for here. Uh, so we we have W row uh, basically is the, this is the input that feeds the uh, decoder. Call is what drives the the decoder in order to figure out what, uh, what, what button is being pressed. That data comes back on W row, and then inside the decoder, it decodes it into this decode out, which is a, you know, zero is zero, one is one, two is two, three is three. The decode out output goes into I binary num, which is your binary number input, and then this module here will decode the binary number input to a seven segment display. That should be it, assuming I didn't make any mistakes, which is unlikely. I think I did make a mistake somewhere, but I haven't found it yet. Uh, but this should be enough. I would think that if I program this code, build it and program it, uh, then if I push one here, it should make a one light up in this seven segment display, the first seven segment display on the go board. Unfortunately, this is this is straight and this is straight. So they're at 90 degrees opposite each other. So let's see if this compiles. So I'm going to create a new project, close the current project. And it's going to be called, where am I going to put it? Yeah, sure, we'll call it keypad demo. And this is going to be based on, for the, for the uh, Nanlang Go board, no, I do do a project, I do do, I do a project where I uh, show how this is created. So there's a video for this. It's like the very first video. If you get the Go board, you can uh, see exactly what all these settings are. But it's a nice 40 FPGA, it's the HX1K, it's the VQ100 package. 
Um, don't get too worried if you don't have any idea what I'm doing. I'm basically creating a project that is telling the tools what FPGA I'm using. Um, that's good. And then I'm going to add some files. Hopefully the files I just created, where are they? Somewhere on my desktop, maybe? Yes. Here we go. All right, so I added decoder for sure. I added this one. And I also added the... Um, Let me see here one second. The seven segment display. I'm just going to copy that file into here just so I have everything kind of self contained. Binary to seven segment. Add that. All right, so now I have decoder, this one and this one. Finish. Those are all the files I need. So they show up over here. Boom, boom, boom. In terms of, con I do need a constraint file. I'm going to, again, borrow the constraint file from a different project, which was one I had done previously. Um, here's the constraints. So I mentioned before there's constraints. Uh, constraints are important in order to um, tell, basically tell the tools like what pin goes where. So um, I can take a look. At, uh, oh, that's the synthesis constraints. There's also a physical constraints. Those are these. So I'll show you once, once, once. Okay. So go board clock constraint. This one is simply um, just defining. It's off the screen. That's neat. Uh, this one basically is just creating. Uh, a clock right here. This is the only, everything else is comments except for this line. So it's creating a clock with a period of 40 nanoseconds and it's called iClock and it uses a port called iClock. Um, a, 40 a 40 nanosecond clock is 25 megahertz. The oscillator on the go board is 25 megahertz. This is used in order to tell the synthesis tool how fast your design is going to go so that uh, the synthesis, synthesis and then place and route. So when it does the timing closure during place and route to see if it meets timing, um, it'll use this clock constraint there to make sure that uh, you don't have any timing errors. Timing errors are very bad. I won't go into timing errors. It's, a, it's its own thing. Uh, but generally, you always, you, you do not want timing errors. They're bad. Um, 25 megahertz is very slow. So I really have no... Um, you know, qualms or concerns that I won't be able to meet timing on this particular uh, design. But uh, good to constrain the clock anyway. And I'm going to add a place and route file. This is the constraint file for the, for the fit. This is a PCF is physical constraint file. So this means physically which pins get mapped where. I'll show you that one. So here is the GoBoard PCF file, physical constraints file. You can download this file if you have the GoBoard. Um, this is specific to the GoBoard. So here's all the pins on the GoBoard that you're able to use. There's a clock, there's LEDs, there's push button switches, seven segment outputs, there's a UART and a VGA. In this particular one, I'm using the seven segment displays. So it's setting the IO of you know, each individual seven segment, seven segment to a specific pin. So if you pulled up the GoBoard schematic, you would see that pin three is O segment one A um, on the on the schematic itself. Uh, LED LED one is pin fifty six. That's all this is doing. So if you changed it, um, it would it wouldn't work. This is an important file. A lot of times people ask me like why are things not working, and usually the answer is you forgot to add the PCF file. So if you don't add the PCF file, the tools are very kind and they just say like, well, I'll just throw this pin over here and this pin over here. And that never is the right the right thing to do. I wish they would warn you and say like, no PCF file specified. Are you sure you didn't mean to include one? Because the answer always is, no, I, I forgot it. Um, so let's see if I actually wrote a whole bunch of Verilog code without any errors, unlikely. Oh, I forgot end module, of course. That's an important one. End module. What else? What else did I do wrong? Come on, synthesis. What else you got for me? Oh, only one error. All right, pretty good. Okay, so let's see what we got here. We got some um, some register bits. So we got 35 register bits used in this particular design. Cool. Those are D flip flops. 
uh, flip flops are like the you know the critical thing that stores state inside an FPGA. I use 35 of them, uh, which is 2% of the device. Uh, we looks like we used 90 LUTs. So LUTs are your lookup tables. Those are uh, on this particular design. It's a LUT on this particular FPGA. It's a LUT four, so it's a four input lookup table. Cool. Uh, how much of that? Seven percent. We use seven percent of our LUTs here. Not too bad. We got plenty of room for other stuff that we will add soon. So let's go ahead and run everything, which will include uh, the synthesis, place and route, time enclosure, and bitstream generation, and then we can program the device and. Fingers crossed, got things right. So while that's running, I'm gonna just gonna check on this code here. Bum, ba, bum, 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 bum. I got 73 people tuning in. I'm watching in 1080p. It looks good in 720p. 480 is a blur. Yeah, it's this is a 1080p monitor, um, so I'm not surprised. Let's see. What does this guy say? For your next stream, number one, second display for live chat. Oh, that's a good idea. I don't have a second a second display. I just have one. Set 1080p, 1920 by 1080 p resolution for YouTube translation. Increase font. Well, I can increase the font easy enough. It is in 1080p. Yes, it is in 1080p. I can read the code, no problem. Okay, looks like we got that figured out. Yeah. Lattice needs a PCF file. Who scrubbed my project comment? What's the maximum speed your design can run on FPGA? Um, the maximum speed, the, the way to find that out would just be to not specify any uh, constraint file at all during synthesis, and synthesis will just try to run it as fast as possible. Um, mm, it'll run it pretty quickly. If you really wanted to stress it, you'd have to like manually be like, okay, run it at 200 megahertz, run it at 225 megahertz, run it at 230 megahertz, and see if it has any timing errors. Um, I don't know why you'd ever want to go faster than your clock. You should really just specify the constraints to be the speed of your clock. Um, it's not worth over constraining. That's called over constraining. It's not. I don't think there's any value to over constrain your design. If it meets timing uh, at 25 megahertz, it'll meet timing at 25 megahertz. You don't need to say like, okay, now meet it at 30 megahertz. Like, do you have a 30 megahertz clock? No. Then who cares? Water break. Okay, so I've built the bitstream. I'm going to go ahead and so this is Diamond Programmer. This is how you program the Go boards. Um, I just this is already set up for programming the Go boards, so I won't go into that um, how exactly that works. But here is the so inside. Oh, I didn't. Where did I put this project? Uh, I put it in Dropbox. I wasn't paying attention to where I was creating this. So let me move it to here. And then I'm gonna uh, close close this project. I just put it in the wrong location, so I copied all the files to the location I really want to work out of, which is not on my Dropbox. It is on my desktop. This one, this one, this one. Okay, that should work. Oh. I gotta add the constraints back in. Sorry, guys. And the design files apparently. Decoder in the top. And the constraints back. Physical constraints. Uh, go ahead and rebuild this again. It should work. Well, one thing I didn't check was I didn't check to see that the uh, the top of the design is correct. Yeah, it looks like it is. 
uh, yeah, to, right here. Top module is keypad state machine demo top. Sometimes, uh, so the, the tools kind of like assume what the top of your design is for you. If some, some tools let you specify it. Like I think Xilinx says like, what's the top of your design? Um, it'll even like draw the hierarchy for you. The lattice tools are really just like pretty bare bones, which is nice. Um, in some respects, because you don't have to worry about like knowing the tool. Like with, if you ever use Avado or uh, the Altera tools, uh, Intel tools, Cordis, uh, they're really big, and learning those tools takes a long time. Where versus like this is really just a dead simple tool that just runs through a specific flow and doesn't you know, it doesn't give you a lot of bells and whistles, which is nice if you don't want the bells and whistles. All right, so I programmed it again. And I'm gonna go find it now, which is here. It should be in, uh, it puts it in a really weird spot. It's SBT outputs bitmap, which is like the most cryptic friggin' location you can think of. But... All right, so that's the bin file. Uh, this should flash the go board. Let's see if I got this right on the first try. It's programming it. <laughs> Sometimes it takes a minute. Um, if you ever fail the ID check, uh, change your port on your USB from USB 1 to 0 or from 0 to 1, and that fixes the problem. Let me not hold it while it's programming. I think my connection got interrupted because I'm holding it, which is probably not a good idea. Okay, I'm placing it on the table, and now I will let it program. This is just because my USB connection is not fantastic. So it's like not finding the board right now. I programmed it earlier, so I know this works. <laughs> Sorry, I'm struggling with not great connection issues. So it sees the serial port. Should work. Come on. There it goes. Um, one other thing I forgot to mention is, you know, usually in a real design, I will simulate before programming. I kind of just went straight to programming. Hmm. All right, so one is a, is a D, four is a C, seven is a six, eight is a seven is six, Seven is B, eight is six, five is nine. I'm clearly doing something close to right. <laughs> can you see these digits? I don't know if you can see them, uh, but when I hit the number one, I'm getting a D and two is a three. So something is not quite right, either with my row and column indexing, I'm guessing, um, because I'm not getting, I'm getting all the digits. One, four, seven. Oh, okay, look at this. So one, four, seven, zero, one, four, seven, zero. So this is, one four seven zero is switched here. So this is switched. Boy, something is switched with row and column for sure. Two five eight F is this column here. Two five eight F. So I don't know if I can logic this out or if I need to just think about what I did wrong. I knew the row and column part was going to be the tricky part. So I clearly indexed one of the two incorrectly. Which one was it? Um, 
Alright, let me pull up the schematic. So row four. Let's see if I switched. Maybe I switched both of them actually. Because they were both backwards, right? So B should be here, but instead it's one, two. D should this should be a D. This is a D right here. And this is a one. So these two are swapped. And four is a C, and this is a C. These two are swapped. And these two are swapped. So my rows and my columns are backwards. I think. Well, let's fix it. So three becomes uh zero. This becomes a one, this becomes a two, this becomes a three. And then this one was the original one. Oops. This is why I wanted to check before I started trying to create a state machine that didn't work. All right, so that switches the rows. So now this is what it used to be. Rows are switched and columns are switched. Let's try this. So I'll reprogram it. And that'll generate the bitstream. I'm also going to grab one more file from another design, the git ignore file. I will be committing all this to git when I'm done, so you can actually have this code. Uh, So you can actually have this code for yourself. You can play with it and enjoy. I don't want to include anything in here. In my Git files. So. In here. Oops. Um, git ignore, you know, you generally shouldn't be committing things that are like your output files from a build, for example. So your git ignore file is useful to ignore um, anything in my build directory that's like specific to the actual build. So like any of the report files, things like that. Never commit that stuff to the repo because it's not useful. You really want to only commit things to the repo that are useful for building your your outputs and not your outputs themselves. Maybe with the exception of the actual uh, bitstream file. The bitstream file might be useful to commit so that you have that like for historical legacy reasons. Uh, okay, so that should have recreated the bitstream with rows and columns swapped. I'll program the design. It'll work this time. Fingers crossed. So it gives you a little warning. It says it says error. It's really just a warning um, that the it's been modified. The, the bitstream has been modified, and it's going to use the new file. Okay, let's see what we got. So now one. Oh my God! It's a one, four, seven, zero is zero, two, five, eight, f, three, six, nine. Damn, this is fine. Okay, we're cooking. I don't know if you can see this, but now it's working correctly. Let's fix the problem. Rows and columns were swapped. So. Where are we at? Quick review. For those of you who haven't been, who just joined the stream, I'm gonna review everything. So here's where we're at. It's been an hour, all right. Uh, go board FPGA, buy one on nanland.com, support this YouTube channel. Um, also check out my Patreon if you want more videos like this. Uh, the Go board is talking to, uh, this is an FPGA development board. So we're programming in Verilog code to get data uh, from this keypad here. It's it's reading the data in by sending a, a row and reading back a column uh, information from the keypad itself into the FPGA here. And the decoded row column information gets sent to the seven segment display for us to look at and make sure that the data getting into the FPGA is correct. Uh, the next state step is actually creating the state machine based on that information coming in. So let's start that process.
Hey, thanks for the uh, hot dog, Grant. I appreciate that. I'm getting hungry for lunch, actually, so this makes me feel a lot better. I'm going to review some chat real quick. Hi, what's up, friends? Hey, Peter, thanks for the recommendation. Glad you've been enjoying working with the Go board. Have TDI chips of the devil? Really, do me? I like them. They seem to just work. The, the, the communication problem wasn't the FTDI chip, it's I just my USB cable just wasn't making great uh, connections. Yeah, Ice Cube is definitely less intimidating. ASMI 06, I agree. Um, Bavado is intense. It's like trying to swim in the ocean when you've never swam in a pool. Um, it's a little overwhelming. That's why I did the Go board with a Lattice FPGA. You know, I just didn't want to overwhelm any beginners who were just starting to figure things out. Uh, okay. Mm, block diagram. Get rid of that. Uh, but now, again, state machine time. So let's, let's create a new file. That's um, going to be the state machine. So I don't need this display controller. I never ended up using this. This was from the, the Digilent resources. I'm going to get rid of that. Um, I also never used key, uh, PMOD keypad. This is from Digilent. So I will delete that. And these are the files I am using. Uh, let's take a minute to push. Um, so let's say seven segment decoding to go board works. Um, I'm committing this to my GitHub so that you all fine folks can see the code. Let's push it. Push it real good. Um, so if you do want to see this code and follow along, GitHub, oops, yep, GitHub, just go to GitHub. Go to my, go to my GitHub repo, uh, github.com forward slash nand land, and check out the, here it is, keypad state machine demo. This is what we are just pushing to right now. So you are welcome to follow along. Uh, here is the code I'm working with. If you want to check it out, it's, uh, it's available to you now. Maybe I should have pushed earlier, so you guys could have gotten a jump, but hey, it's working. This is a code that's working, uh, so this is actually something you can play with on your own if you have a Go board and the thing, the exact, the exact digital one thing, which you probably don't have. Uh, that's just fine. And again, support me on Patreon. Keep me making these fun videos. Uh, I, the Patreon support really does help keep me motivated and keep me uh, involved and in talking to you guys, so appreciate all the support there. Um, so here's all the code that we just wrote. Uh, feel free to check it out. Back to the code. New file. And this is going to be called state machine. That'd be because I'm not doing creative. And that's what it's doing. Let's copy some basic stuff here. So what this is going to be doing is it's going to be, um, let's say we, we light up LED one. If the pass, if the, we're going to do a, let's do a three digit. We'll do a three digit uh, password basically to unlock the safe. Uh, so this is a safe that is maybe inside of a hotel room or something like that. You can store a three digit password, uh, which I'm going to be hard coding just for simplicity here. Three digit password to, um, to unlock the safe. If you, if you type in the three digits correctly in the right order, then LED one will light up. If three digits are entered in the wrong order, then LED four will illuminate and LED one will turn off. Uh, that is the whole state machine here. Um, really the purpose is just to demonstrate like what a state machine looks like uh, inside of Verilog. In case you've never seen one before, uh, this, will, this will get you more familiar with it so you get more comfortable. So this is gonna be taking in uh, some LEDs. Sorry, the LEDs are outputs, not inputs. And here I'm going to call it like O uh, safe unlock unlocked safe 
block. So I'm not saying it's specifically good, like an LED that's going to be driving it, but at the top level module, I'm going to wire these to an LED. Uh, so it's more they're more explicit for what their purpose is here. And I also need to know what the um, keypad press is. So input three down to zero of keypad keypad digit. Like that. So this I think is everything I will need. to drive some, some, just some LEDs here. I'm still gonna keep the seven segment display stuff so that we can still see on the seven segment display what we're, what numbers we're hitting. Um, yeah. I might wanna add a switch just to reset the state machine. I'm gonna add a reset signal here and I'm gonna tie that to a switch, so. Uh, push button. So the Go board has four push buttons on it. I'm going to tie button one to a reset. So basically when I push button one in, it'll reset the state machine inside back to its initial state so we can try again. Um, you know, state machines have a flow to them, right? You start at the, you start at some initial condition, you work your way through the state machine flow, uh, and you get back to your initial condition. At some point, you might be in the middle of your state machine, and you might want to get back to the beginning again. Usually, that's a reset signal of some kind. Um, so I'm going to be using just a push button to reset us back to the initial condition. One will be used. So that'll get tied to reset later on when we wire this up. And I think that's all I need for the for the module itself. Um, all right, so state machine time. When I create a state machine, I like to use, I like to use, there's a couple different ways you can do state machines in Verilog, two common ways. One is the multi, um, multi always block process and one is a single always block process, a single always block method. I don't like it when I see the state machine that has like previous state, next state in one little always block, and that's the sequential part. And then everything else is the combinational part in like a giant, in a giant always block. Um, and then with, because the previous state, next state stuff never like sits well with me and never really made a lot of sense to me. I prefer to do, a so I won't show you that method because it's, I'm not gonna show you something I don't like. Uh, I'm gonna show you the way I like to do state machines. Um, uh, number one, I always like to do uh, more a more based state machine, M-O-O-R-E, um, which is all of your outputs depend on the state that you're in. That's it. Um, your outputs don't depend on the inputs at all. That's a melee state machine. So melee and more are the two types of state machines that are commonly talked about in like an intro to FPGA design or Boolean logic design class. Um, I definitely gravitate towards the more machines. I think they make a lot of sense and it's very explicit. You can see very explicitly what your outputs are doing. They're easy to draw. Uh, so more machine is the way to go. More machine, single always block. That's the recommendation here. Uh, it's up for debate, but uh, it's my YouTube channel, so I'm right. Okay, uh, always at pause edge, my clock. Maybe we're in some sequential logic. All right, so this is the state machine itself. Um, let's start. If um, I Reset equals one tick be zero. So if uh, sorry one. So if reset is high, then we're going to say the state machine. Something called RSM main goes back to in it the initial condition. Um, so R underscore is a register. Um, I use R underscore to indicate things that things a register. You've seen I underscore for inputs. O underscore for outputs. W underscore for wires, here's a new one, R underscore for register. So any register logic, meaning any clocked logic, I use R underscore. And the reason it's R is because I'm gonna create it and it's gonna be reg. Uh, let's think, how many states am I gonna need? I'm probably gonna need four or five. Let's do a three bit state machine. So two down to zero, 
RSM main like that. So this is the reg. Uh, so R underscore is reg. Uh, you're creating registered logic or sequential logic, clock logic, fun stuff. Okay. Um, the other thing I like to do with state machines is I like to create parameters that... So one way you could do this is you could just do, you know, 3 tick B O O O. But that's not very descriptive. So if you want to actually write code that's readable, you can do this. Uh, local param init equals 3 tick B O O. Is that the right spec for that? Um, so this is a local param is a, a, a parameter that's local to this module, so it doesn't exist anywhere else. Um, it's called init, and I assign it to something that's 3 tick B 0 0 0. I'm going to create a couple more. Uh, for each one of my states I always use a local param for because it's, again, just clean, nice code. In VHDL, there's a similar thing you can do where you can create basically your own type for the state machine. Um, so, And actually, I like that a little better because it's basically creating, you create an enumerated type in VHDL that'll automatically start at zero. So it's zero is like initial condition, one is the next one, two is the next one. Uh, Verilog is a little bit more tedious here where you actually need to create every single state with its own local param. So it's a little bit of typing. We'll call this digit one, little three tick B oh, oh, 001. This is where it's checking to see each digit. So I'll be more explicit. We'll say check digit one. Do I even need an initial state, or can I just go straight to check digit one? Probably just do that. I don't even need to bother with this one. So that's that. We're gonna have, I said it was a three digit uh, safe that we're trying to open here. So those are the three digits. Um, we're gonna need a condition where uh, the safe is locked, uh, unlocked. So safe unlocked. We took B01 and a safe locked. We took B100. So it looks like I chose the right number of bits because we're we have five states that I can see right now. Uh, check digit one, check digit two, check digit three, safe locked, safe unlocked. Each one of those are our states. So that's the reset state. Uh, else. Thank you, VS Code, for writing begin and end for me. Um, so now we're going to actually process the the state machine. Um, so again, I think I mentioned it, I always use the case statement for this. So case RSM uh, main uh, SM is state machine. Uh, when uh, no wait, Verilog uh, check it one. So, in the right. All right, so check digit one. So what's happening here? So um, I'm gonna hard code the unlock password. Um, it's a three-digit password, and it's gonna be. Um, Ooh, I don't know. Let's see. It's, a four, it's four digits, four tick decimal. Um, how about... Eight, six, zero. By the way, this is not how you would actually, uh, I don't think you'd really like hard code a password inside your VHDL, inside your Verilog code. You'd want to make it settable via the user. But again, we're just, we're just doing some demo here. So we're checking digit one. If we're checking digit one, then we expect that if uh, I keypad digit equals password digit one, then we want RSM main to go to check digit two. So this is the state that it's going to go to. Else, meaning the keypad digit is wrong, we want RSM main to go to check 
go to safe locked. We failed. That is the first one. And we're going to be doing the same thing for check digit two. It's going to look very similar. So I'm going to go ahead and copy this here. So if the next digit pressed is correct, then we go to three. If it's wrong, we lock the safe. Check digit three. If this is correct, then we are in the safe unlocked state. We've made our way to a good state. Um, you don't technically need these begin and ends, by the way, around um, a single line. Verilog assumes that if it's just one line underneath an if statement, then um, then it's part of that if statement. If I had two lines here, it wouldn't treat the second line as part of that if statement. It would treat it as uh, like a, its own line beyond the if statement. Um, so I generally, I, I always use begin and end blocks around everything because it's it's like similar to C where you know I always use brackets everywhere. It just keeps your code clean and and and. It's easy to understand what's going on um, and easy, harder to make mistakes if you just use, by default, just always use begin and ends. Um, I've, I've been using Python a lot recently and I'm a big fan of the Python syntax of just like tabs are your, tabs are important for not only legibility but also for functionality. That's the right way to do it. But you know what, we're dealing with languages that were written long before that was acceptable. So. Uh, let's hit safe unlocked. When we're in safe unlocked, again, this is a more machine, so we're only going to be driving our outputs um, in the safe unlocked state. So we're actually, I guess we just stay here, huh? Mm, I'm just going to keep the same, same thing. I'll just stay in the state. If we're in safe locked, then we're just going to same thing. We'll just stay here, which is fine. Normally, you'd want like a way to like get back to some initial condition or something like that without having to reset the whole thing. But in this case, we have a button to just reset us. So this is the state machine flow. You will notice that this just basically handles like what happens to this one signal RSM main. I like this because we're only trying to follow the logic of the state machine. So this is as minimal code as possible to just traverse the logic of the state machine. I haven't specified yet what happens to our outputs. Our outputs are O safe unlocked and O safe locked. Again, this is a more machine. So those need to be, I, I need to be able to set these two outputs based on only the state information. And I have that information and here's what it looks like. I'll put it above the state machine. Um, we're going to be assigning O safe locked. Uh, basically, it's going to be a, it's going to be set when we are in the locked state and cleared in all other situations. So uh, here's a new one. The Verilog has what's called a ternary operator, question mark operator. Pretty slick. I'm a big fan of it. Um, so we're going to say O safe locked is equal to RSM main uh, equal equal um, safe locked value of true value of false. Uh, this is one way to do this. There's a couple of ways you can do this. So safe locked. Basically, what this is saying is uh, tell me. So it's, it's saying. Is RSM main equal to safe locked? Question mark. If, if true, do this. If false, do this. That's one way to do it. This is called a ternary. Ternary operator. Uh, C has something similar. A lot of languages have a ternary operator. Um, I'm a fan of it because it's just a simple way to write, you know, instead of doing an FL statement or something like that, you can just write in one line what you want to do. Um, usually pretty clear. Um, another way to do this is O safe lock equals R S M main equal equal safe locked. Just like this, this will do it too. 
Um, what this is, a, this is a little bit, I like this a little bit better because uh, it's cleaner. It's, it's well, less code, I should say. Um, so basically, this is doing a comparison here. It's saying if our state machine main is equal to, to safe locked, uh, then, then this, this whole right side of the equal sign evaluates to true. If it's not true, it evaluates to false. And that's the one for true, zero for false, and boom, we're done. Uh, so who needs a ternary operator when you can go ahead and just do it this way? Um, ternary, if, if this were something different, like if this were like a four bit vector or something, this wouldn't work. Um, so in this case, it does work just because it's a one bit. I'm looking for a true or a false and, and the double equal sign, that's what it produces, true or false. Same thing for unlocked. All right. And because I am um, annoying, I will do that to align them up. Okay, so now we have a more machine here. Um, I'm gonna do, put a little bit of comments in here. Or machine, or state machine. Takes the input key press. Looks for the specific password. Eight six zero. That is correct. We'll unlock. We'll drive O safe unlocked I. If that is incorrect, we'll drive O safe locked I. Can be reset at any time. So I can't understate how important comments are, you know, just to, to yourself or to your future self or to anybody else who has to maintain this code. Um, like, please put comments in, especially at the top of the file. It's just like, what is this thing doing? What's the purpose of this file at a high level? Uh, this is really all the information you need. It takes in a key press, looks for a password. If it's correct, it'll do this. If it's incorrect, it does this, and you can reset it. Um, that pretty much tells everybody, like, basically when they look at this code, like, what is this doing? You know, I have no idea what this code is doing. So let me figure it out. Uh, this should be basically everything we need here. I do have a concern that I haven't yet stated. And my concern is that these are mechanical switches and they might be glitchy. So I might need to debounce them. Um, I do a project on debouncing inside of the, for a GoBoard tutorial, because I can tell you that these switches here, these push button switches are bouncy. And so when you push one, you think you're just getting one key press. It's like I push it once, I should get one key press. But really it's a mechanical switch and it's actually like, it'll like mechanically like tap, 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 tap. So you might get like two or three presses just when you're pushing it one time, just due to the mechanical nature of the switch. And that might be happening here as well. I wouldn't be surprised. So I might need to add some debounce filtering on these key presses in order to um, filter out. If this isn't working, it's probably because of that. So, but we'll see. Um, I'm going to take a break for a second and check on comments, which again, I will take next time I will do uh, in its own monitor. I guess I'll get a second monitor. Sean, thank you for the, uh, thank you for the sticky soup, the super thingy, the money. Thank you for the donation, my dude. Um, are there any VHDL books I would recommend for learning VHDL? Um, I will get back to you on that because I don't have any off the top of my head. Um, there used to be some good books, but I mean, I went to school 15 years ago, so it might have changed. Um, I don't have anything great. In general, Sean, I, you know, I, depends how you learn. I'm, I'm more of a, um, you know, I'm more of a project-based learner myself, so I like to actually do projects and learn that way rather than reading uh, a lot of the code. So um, depends. Everybody's a little bit different. Thank you, ntesla66. Hey, man, shout out to you. Uh, thank you for the support. Appreciate that. Also, I like your name. <laughs> Hi, Craig. Craig and I work together. 
Thank you. You're welcome. I appreciate all you guys. Okay, looks like you're getting some recommendations in the chat for VHDL books, which is good. Yeah, I don't have any great recommendations myself, but looks like other people do, so definitely check those out. Um, yeah, if you guys want to, uh, you know, make your comments stand out a little bit, you can do the, the the chat sticker, super sticker. I don't YouTube very often, okay? But I'll see your, I'll be more likely to see your comment if you uh, attach a dollar amount to it. Okay. State machine done. Let's see if this compiles. I don't think it will. But let's see. State machine. I got to add it to the project. Oh, I didn't instantiate it either. I need to do that. I forgot in module again. Boy, I'm not really good at that. Okay, end module. There you go. I also need an end case too, don't I? All right, let's go here. In case, in case. And does that line up? In case. Again, I need an end for. What my tabbing is right here. This needs to be tabbed in. In case goes in. And. And then um, I also need to instantiate this guy, which I forgot to do. So that's important. So right now it's not instantiated, so it's not going to do very much. So let's instantiate it. I'm going to instantiate it uh, right here. So state machine is the name. The instance is called safe unlock. Safe password. Tracker. Instance. Sure. The name doesn't really matter. It's only used for like synthesis reports and things like that. So again, the, the dot and then the name is the name inside of the... You guys don't need to see me twice, do you? Um, the dot and then the name is the name uh, on the inside of the module. And then open parentheses is the name of the wire or the register, whatever it is at this level, the, the higher level module. So inside, outside, if that helps. Uh, so I clock is I clock. I reset, I said I'm gonna tie that to a switch. So I switch one. Uh, keypad digit is decode out. And safe unlock is gonna be an LED. Unlock is one and locked is four. That should be good there. So now I'm instantiating the actual state machine. Let's go ahead and see if I did any better with compiling, coding. Okay, I didn't get any errors, which is surprising and good. Wow, the only errors I had were forgetting the word end module. That's not bad. Okay, resource utilization for keypad state machine demo top. So it picked the right top module, that's a win. Uh, we're at 40 reg register bits, 3%. We were at 2% before, so we, we've we increased it by 1%. That makes sense. We were at 7% on LUTs, now we're at 8%. So what I did is generating some logic, which is expected. Um, so I will try programming this. And again, I am suspicious expecting that this won't work due to the mechanical bouncing of the keys. I think I'm just going to get an incorrect password every single time. Uh, let's stream. Oh, I only did synthesis. I did not run its stream creation. Um, so it synthesized fine, but it's got to go through place and route uh, and then generate the bit stream. I forgot that part. That's important can't program a bitstream file if you do not have a bitstream. Okay. This should work better. It gives me that error again. Again, it's a warning, it's not an error. 
Okay. So the so it looks like state four is lit up, so it's in an incorrect state. If I hmm. it's always reading incorrect. It's jumping right to incorrect. I wonder if this is constantly sending information to the keypad. Probably is. It's probably always getting back some data. Hmm. That's constantly saying state is incorrect, state is incorrect, because it's traversing through the state machine really, really quickly. Okay. How to fix. Hmm. How to fix. Let me think. So I only want to register a new digit sometimes. I don't want to always send. So I'm going to need a new signal called I keypad DV. So I do use DV for data valid. Um, DV is data valid. Uh, I'm a big fan of DV being data valid. Um, so this is going to be a single clock cycle pulse that I'm going to have to generate. Basically, when I know that the digit coming out of the decoder is correct, then I'm going to be sending a DV pulse. And that will basically tell the state machine to increment to the next state. Um, I didn't have this before, but that's what, so what was happening. I should have realized this wasn't going to work, actually. Um, you need something to like trigger the state machine to be like, okay, let me see if... Uh, I should move on to the next uh, to the next state. So let's do that real quick. I keypad EV data valid. Um, so this is going to basically only run the state machine if I'm getting a data valid pulse. Um, yeah, so this is maybe worth mentioning a little bit. So a data valid pulse is, when I write DV in my code, it means that it's a one clock cycle wide pulse that tells the next module downstream to like look at the data or do something because this data valid pulse is high. It means I should like try check something. When I didn't have this data valid pulse here, it was basically always <laughs> running through the state machine in like five clock cycles and immediately it was like clock cycle one invalid clock cycle two invalid clock cycle three invalid and just like jump right to invalid uh or state safe locked i should say uh, so the password was invalid the safe was locked and that's why we were seeing led4 light up immediately um the, the keypad the data valid thing here will um will prevent that from happening which is good but now i need to figure out a way to actually do a data valid, like generate that data valid pulse at this level. So how do I do that? How do I generate a one clock cycle wide pulse that tells the state machine that the digit that to like look at the digit basically is what I need to figure out. The way I would think would make sense is if if the digit changes. So if the digit changes then you should look at it. So basically what I'm saying is if, if the state of decode out is different from what it used to be, then we can assume that the user is actively like pushing the button in some way. Again, we still have the D glitch problem to deal with, uh, potentially, but this might be a, a decent solution. I need to know what happens when you release when you release the key. Nothing. Okay. All right, so this, this might work. Um, so I need to create a little bit of... Um, I could modify... So I could do this two ways. I could either modify the decoder to provide the, the data valid pulse at the decoder itself. Uh, but again, I, I kind of took this decoder from Digilent directly 
I don't want to modify somebody else's code. Um, generally, that's like not a great idea. So I'm going to add the data valid pulse at the highest level. I another thing I generally don't like to do is I generally don't like to put a lot of like always blocks at the highest level of the of the program. The highest in my mind, the highest level of your program should just be like instantiating all your blocks, wiring everything together, no sequential logic created at this level. Um, which previously that's what this was, um, but I'm about to break that rule. So I'm breaking my own rules here. Sorry. So I'm going to create a registered version of the decode signal. So R decode out, which is again a register, uh, is going to get the W decode out. So this is on every clock cycle. It's going to take whatever's in decode out, sample it once, and put it on R decode out, R underscore decode out. What this is going to do is create a one clock cycle delay between W decode out and R decode out. I need to create the register, which I have not done yet. So let's do that. Up here. Reg three down to zero R decode out. So again, this is you know getting back to like the coding style. W underscore is a wire. R underscore is a register. And now I know a little bit about this information. This needs to be assigned in an always block. This one needs to be assigned. This one cannot be assigned in an always block. It has to be assigned either with an assignment statement or the output of a of a module, which is what it is here. So you know it tells you. Your coding style tells you information about your code, which is useful. All right, so I have R decode out and W decode out. Now I want to generate a data valid pulse when the two are different. So basically, if I if I was pushing a four, but now I'm pushing eight, that's going to tell the state machine to look at the new value, open your eye, look at the value, and and do something. Check to see if it's the correct password sequence. And the way you can do this is you can say a uh, couple different things here again. Um, I'll just do it this way. This is the most, uh, I would say, beginner friendly one. So if our decode out does not equal w decode out, then. R, this is actually going to be another register. I called the WD code out before, but that's not, uh, sorry, WD code data valid, but it's actually going to be a register. So I need to create another register. R underscore decode data valid. And that's going to be assigned inside the always block here. This is going to be set to one. I'll pick the one. If they're not the same, our decode data valid gets zero. So if the two are the same, that means that your data, your data coming from your keypad is unchanging. So your data valid pulse should be zero. If the two are different, that means that the data coming from the keypad has changed. And now we should check it. Where this could fall apart. Uh, is if you push the same digit twice, if you hit five and then five again, how do you know that that second five is actually a key press? Uh, we're gonna ignore that for now. Uh, we're gonna have to assume that the data has to be different. Again, I'm using the get out of jail free card of this is a demo, so who really cares? Uh, the other way you could do the data valid pulse, by the way, is if it were a wire. Um, originally I had it as a wire, I changed it to a register, but if it were a wire, I could do an assignment here. W decode data valid is equal to R decode out not equal to W decode out. This is the same, this is basically doing the same thing. Uh, there is a slight difference between these two things. So uh, this is I did this before, uh, where I do a comparison, and then the result of the comparison can be assigned to a single bit wide uh, wire. Kind of a neat trick. Um, the difference here is that this is the output of a LUT, you know, the output of a lookup table. It's an assignment operator, so it's not clocked logic. This will happen immediately. So as soon as WD code out and RD code out are different, this gets assigned. The difference here with the R decode data valid is that the R decode data valid is inside of a clocked always block. 
So it's gonna it's gonna happen one clock cycle later. Um, this is a bit for beginners. This is a bit of a confusing concept to grasp. But um, when you start like simulating waveforms a lot, you can start to see when things happen relative to each other. And this just becomes second nature where you just start to say like, okay, I know that this is going to be one clock cycle later than this. Uh, but it's not intuitive just looking at the code with the first time you look at it. I'm not going to use this one. I'll keep it there just as a note. Learn the method of generating data valid. False. This would create a DB pulse one clock cycle earlier than R because data valid. There you go. Okay. Um, that should help the problem. Again, I think that there could still be an issue of debouncing, but we're getting closer, so let's give this a shot. Does, did I write code good? Did I do the good codes? Programming. Yes. All right, time to check in with you fine people. My VS code setup. Uh, I didn't. I'll show you in a second if I have any VS code uh, extensions. I'm not. I don't actually know. Can you daisy chain Go boards together? Yes, you can talk over the PMod connection to, to have them talk to each other. I actually did a project where I had two Go boards talking to each other over Bluetooth. Um, that was the previous one. That was pretty cool. What about a passcode with repeating digits? Yeah. Yeah. Good catch. Um, yeah, this whole video will be uploaded later, by the way. So it's available for anybody. Uh, somebody asked about my extensions. I never actually showed the extensions, uh, but what do I have here? Modern VHDL and Verilog HDL are the two that I have. Um, and a GitHub one, and a WSL one. Uh, but these are the two for uh, VHDL and the Verilog one. I just have the Verilog and just picked one. Sounded good. Okay, um, where are we at? Let me go to the chat for a second. Goodbye. Did this build? Looks like it did. Let's try programming. Error, not an error. Okay, moment of truth. The light is not lit up anymore, so that is a good sign. We are not currently, the fact that this LED4 is not lit up tells me that we are not currently in the, in the safe, bad, safe, locked state. I'm gonna reset the state machine just to make doubly sure. Uh, let's try a three digit password. See, let's try just pushing number two, see what happens. Oh. I pushed the number two, we went immediately to safe locked. Reset. Uh, what's the password? 860, I think. So let's push eight. Oh, we're not, we're still in an okay state. Six. Oh, still in an okay state. Zero. Oh, LED one lit up, guys. Are you as excited as I am? I'm very excited. We unlocked the safe. Amazing. Let's, let's do that again. Ready? All right, so I'll do a bad password. Five. Okay, we're immediately, we have the wrong password immediately. Five is wrong. Start over. Zero, wrong. E, wrong. What about eight? Oh, eight is good. That's a good, that's a good signal. What about six? That's good. No lights lit up. What about zero? Ah, we, we got to the safe unlocked. Well, I'll do something a little bit different. How about eight, six, one? Eight, six, one. LED four is lit up. That tells me that the safe is locked. So that is not right. Try again. Eight, six, Zero. Safe is unlocked. Hey, all right. We wrote a state machine. Uh, this is a very terrible safe, <laughs> a safe system, um, because you can literally figure it out <laughs> by just following seeing what uh, what lights light up. 
So yeah, if you're in charge of safety at a hotel, don't do anything that I just did, because uh, that's a really bad idea. But you can certainly leverage this idea and make it a little bit, a little bit, uh, you know, more clever. Do some smarter things than I just did. But I hope this this does show you guys, uh, you know, a little bit about how to wire up a few modules together, uh, how to create a state machine inside of Verilog. Um, yeah, maybe some other tips and tricks along the way, ternary operators and all sorts of fun things, the difference between registers and wires. Um, so that was about an hour and 15 minutes to get that thing up and running, including some debugs. So not bad overall. Um, I'm happy. Uh, let me know what you guys think overall. If you guys have any questions, I'll, you know, browse the chat for a little bit and um, just check to see if you guys have any questions or anything else you want me to talk about here. I'll be maybe doing that for another five minutes or so. Let's see what we got. What about a passcode with repeating digits? Yeah, Dominic, uh, this currently doesn't support a passcode with repeating digits because the way that I'm detecting data, data validity of the key press is by a key changing. So that is true. I, I will not, uh, you can't detect repeating digits. Hey, what's up? Just came through, watch your video before hardware interview. It was helpful. Glad it was helpful. I'm not gonna try to pronounce your name. Harsha, Harsha Vardhan. I guess I did. We're doing System Verilog in class. Uh, System Verilog's cool. I haven't done a ton of videos on System Verilog. Um, usually my audience is more just learning Verilog and stuff, and I feel like there's not even enough good content for Verilog, so I'm focusing on that. But yeah, System Verilog is great, especially for test benches. Lock is not supposed to tell you that the password is wrong unless you type it in completely, otherwise it's too easy to brute force. Yes, ASMI06, I 100% agree. Do not... <laughs> I could change the state machine to basically allow you to proceed through three digits before getting into the invalid state. That's that's a much better solution. So I, I fully agree. Um, how would you modify this to change the password? Okay, so if you didn't see that, the password itself is hard-coded in here. Um, local param password digit one, eight, password digit two, six, password digit three, zero. And I think I comment here, and I'm looking for specifically eight, six, zero. Uh, not the most flexible situation. If you ever want to reprogram, if you ever want to change your password, you have to reprogram the FPGA with this implementation. That's not the goal of the demo, guys, okay? Let's focus on the real goal here. The real goal is to show you what a state machine looks like. And I think I did that. Um, he is debugging, come on. If I were to study FPGAs and whatnot, would it be best to study at university? Uh, or is it plausible on one's own? I mean, I definitely think the you know, it's definitely possible to get a really good education for programming online. There's tons of resources online. And that's really what my websites and channel, YouTube channel are trying to get you to do is, is learn things that um, are more difficult to learn um, in a university. A lot of programming, you know, you're hacking away at stuff. The only way to get good at it is just to like do it, just to like hack at it. So a classroom is good to give you some foundation, maybe give you some guidance, um, but you really need to just like be in the lab, doing the lessons, or at home, you know, writing the code and smashing your head against the desk over and over and over again in order to really get it in your brain of like how this works. And every language is different, right? So, you know, switching from, like I'm more of like a, a hardware engineer, like low level stuff, FPGAs, embedded C and all that kind of stuff. Every now and then I have to write like JavaScript or CSS or HTML um, and my brain just starts to melt. Like it's just, I haven't yet put it, I haven't gotten that information in there deep enough for me to like get really good at that kind of stuff. So I can do it, but it's like mostly I'm looking for examples of how somebody else did the thing I'm trying to do, uh, which is most of programming. I mean, you're just trying to find something that you can leverage and, and work with and do what you want to do. So find a cool project and do it on your own. I definitely think you can do it with outside of a university classroom. I think the university gives you really good guidance and some direction. Um, so that's why people, you know, that's why, that's why that exists. Uh, yeah, Electromatic, let's put three digits on the back of our credit cards. Agree, it's not, yeah, not always about safety. Sometimes it's more about convenience. Is there a possibility of you exploring MIPI DSI? Uh, perhaps a few people have asked me about MIPI, and I do want to do some camera stuff, so I will throw that in the maybe pile.
Uh, DDR tutorials, sure. You unknowingly solved the, boun the bouncing problem using data valid logic. Yeah. These streams, are you helpful? Great, I'm glad you agree, you think they're helpful, KSS. Why more? Isn't Melee the way to go? My professor said Melee is greater than more. Well, this is my YouTube channel, and I think more is better. Uh, so there, tell your professor he's wrong. Uh, don't do that, he'll give it, get a bad grade. I like more better because I think the state machine flow is easier to follow, right? So you just create one always block, it dictates what your state machine is doing, how it flows, and your outputs are you, your outputs are just really clearly assigned right here, right? Safe locked, safe unlocked, only depends on what state you're in. It doesn't depend on any inputs being pressed or anything like that. Um, I think it's it's just clearer. It's easier to, to block. It's easier to when you create a if I were to create a state machine chart of what this is what looks like like in Visio or something, you could absolutely do that. Um, the outputs just are a little bit clearer. Mealy machines get a little wild, and um, personal preference. How does a Mealy machine look in code? That's a different video I think would be to show that, but I don't generally do them, so I'm not gonna show you that. How can we solve the issue of repetition in password digits? You would have to you'd have to find a way to have a five and another five generate something different. So um, I would need to think about that a little bit, and I'm not sure off the top of my head how you would do that. This brings back memories. Uh, simulation tools do you recommend? Yeah, the lattice ones are not great. I I use Model Sim for simulation uh, personally. Ooh, EDA Playground. EDA Playground's pretty good. So, y'all ever use EDA Playground? Because it's good. Um, I have my own. I mean, that's what I use on Nanland, is, is uh, EDA Playground stuff. So, EDA Playground is great because you can see right in your browser. You don't have to install anything. You can just see in your browser. Uh, like, here, I'll show you. You know, here's a spy master that I did. Uh, here's the, the test bench code over here. Here's the design itself. And you can run it directly in the browser, uh, which is pretty sick. And get signals. Let's add the test, let's add the unit under test. Boom! How about that, guys? Did you know about this? If you watch my videos, you might have seen this before. Um, but yeah, this is great. Um, because I can just save them. They're linked to my, my Google account. I can just save these this, this stuff and bring it up later. You can zoom in on this. Let's see. I forgot how to do it. It's been a while. Is it mouse, mouse wheel up? Oh, no, maybe I got to click. Zoom, 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 zoom. Yeah, so you can zoom in on stuff. You know, you can see waveforms and everything. Um, I could create a simulation for the code I just did, but I'm out of time, so I'm not going to do that. But if I were to do that, I would probably do it for you guys in EDA Playground so you could download the... the um, you, know, you could actually run the same code that, that I'm running here and see it and play with it yourself. Uh, but yeah, EDA Playground's great. It's free. Like It's free, it's web-based. I love that stuff. What else? Okay, uh, simulation, we talked about that. I think about it, making a project of two go-boards talk to each other would be great. I did, I did that, uh, I did have two go-boards talking with a Bluetooth connection. Check that one out. You do a video about defining rules. Great. Uh, all right, guys, I'm out of time here. Uh, I appreciate the the stickers and the likes and uh, just the general feedback. It sounds like it was helpful for a lot of you, so I do plan on doing more of these in the future. Um, and it's good for me to just uh, stay motivated, crank some code out. Again, if you if you want to do what I was doing here. Um, buy a go board nanland.com they're available for sale um, I make them and ship them out myself and it really does help to keep me uh, cranking out code and cranking out tutorials and things like that so these are available this is from Digilent this is not me um, but you can buy these uh, tons of PMOD connections that, that add and enhance more functionality so you can make the go board be an accelerometer interface a gyroscope a sd memory card interface the list is there's a huge like maybe a hundred eight like an adc a dac all these different things that you can hook up to the go board so you can add more functionality 
whatever project you want to do. I've done a few. I did a Bluetooth one last time. That was pretty cool. Uh, so go board, check it out, nanland.com. Support me on Patreon. Uh, that really does help me to you know, stay engaged with you guys and keep making good content. And uh, yeah, again, like, like, like the channel and uh, come back soon. Uh, I'm tired of talking, so I'm going to stop now. Hope that was fun. Bye, y'all.